Hello, welcome to the first lecture for EMA 542, Advanced Dynamics. When we meet live online, we'll go over the w syllabus, the course website, all of that. And I also want to uh, each of you to introduce yourselves, but we'll cover that later. For now, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Matt Allen, a professor here for about the past 15 years. This is what I would have looked like if I was all spiffed up 15 years ago. Um, this is what I look like doing experimental dynamics. And here I am more recently doing some uh, other experimental dynamics and some aerodynamics thrown in. So uh, on a more serious note though, I love dynamics. Um, it's a big part of my research, what I do for work. Um, I have a lot of different projects in the area of dynamics. Um, this is the engine from an F-16 or F-15, F-16, I think this is. This is down here at the airport in Wisconsin. One thing that we study in my group are the bolted joints that hold things together and how they behave under dynamic loads when this engine is spinning and shaking and moving. Uh, I also work with NASA to, uh, on the loads and dynamics or basically the forces that the new space launch system will feel as it's launched and as it flies. You can imagine that every little part, you know, even this little connection between the booster and the core stage, we need to know what forces that's going to feel. How strong does it need to be to make it to space to, um, without breaking? And then when it is time to separate the booster from the core stage, that it's ready to let go. Uh, I also do some work with Air Force on uh, super high-speed vehicles and understanding the forces that we get if we fly at hypersonic speeds like Mach 5 or greater and how we model all of that. And lots of other things. I've worked on wind turbines over the years, micro and nano systems and biosystems. We'll see a lot of that in this class. I hope that I'll be able to convince you that dynamics are important for you as well. Here's a fun little example from the internet of someone who didn't appreciate the importance of dynamics. They took their new Ferrari, million dollar Ferrari, out for a drive, got it up somewhere around 200 miles an hour, and hit a utility pole. And uh, pieces of the car were scattered all over the place. The thing I want to point out though, you've had statics class and maybe you can kind of imagine how big of an Instron machine we'd have to have to put a Ferrari in it and pull it and rip the back off like this, right? I mean, the amount of force is like almost incomprehensible. But um, just by accelerating this car up to 200 miles an hour and then decelerating it very quickly by hitting a pole, we generated that force without even meaning to. Well, this driver did at least. And uh, this is the consequence. So understanding dynamics can be really important. If we ignore it, it can have really severe consequences. It also can be important in sports. And here's a couple of fun little photos as examples. Um, and again, the amount of force we generate, right? If you took that soccer ball and pushed on it with your hand, it'd be hard to dent it in that much. And yet this player managed to dent the soccer ball just by putting his face in the wrong place at the wrong time. All right, so what are we gonna learn in this class for real though? Um, in 202, you learned about 2D dynamics and you learned about force and acceleration. We'll, we'll review some of that today. This class really focuses on 3D dynamics and things that might seem pretty counterintuitive at first. Um, one interesting thing is captured in this video. So in this video, you can see um, we get a disc spinning on a very smooth spinning turntable. And if this was 2D dynamics, the acceleration would just be outward, right? That wheel should just slide right out. Uh, centripetal force should just throw it out and off the table. You'll see some other things sliding around later and see that happen. But yeah, there you go with that one that just fell down. Here though, what's happening is the disc is kind of like a top. It has a gyroscopic moment. And 
So the combination of all of those things causes interesting things to happen. Now that it's not rolling anymore, we'll see that disk go flying off, right? That was 2D dynamics as it just goes flying off. Um, similarly with these balls, right? They're thrown on there. They should just fly right off, but they develop as they roll, they develop enough of a gyroscopic force that it actually causes the ball to change direction and just does some crazy complicated things. So at this point, I can't give you a simple explanation for why those crazy things happen. Um, 3D dynamics, you know, just do seem really counterintuitive at first. Like why does a top not fall down? If it's, if you take a top and you just set it on a table, it falls right over. If you spin it, it does a complicated um, dance on the table. And so all of that um, is explainable by 3D dynamics, but before we can even start to explain it, we need to understand a lot of vector concepts. How is this used? Um, well, anything that moves in 3D, you might need to understand 3D dynamics for, but this gyroscopic effect, which we'll spend a lot of time on, is used in a handful of specific applications. One of them is in satellite orientation control. If you're a, a space station or a satellite out in space and you want to reposition or reorient the satellite, say we're pointing um, towards the North Pole and we want to flip around and point towards the South Pole. How do we do that? We're flying in space in a vacuum. There's nothing to push on. In the movies, you might see people fire rockets, right? And so they, you could fire a rocket, accel cause the satellite to accelerate and rotate, and then you could fire some other rockets to reverse that rotation and hope you land right at the positioning that you want. That's really not what's done in most cases. That might be done for things like a vehicle, like, the, like a rocket docking with a space station. But for satellite attitude control, we usually use gyroscopes. One of the reasons is you spin up a, a gyroscope, which is just a wheel on a shaft, you can do that with electrical power you get from the sun. And so you have um, the ability to recharge and to reuse that orientation device over and over again. So we'll talk a little bit about that in this class. To really get into the details, you need to take EMA 542 satellite dynamics. But we'll cover some of the basics. But these types of 3D effects are important for all kinds of things, you know, rockets, um, missiles with guidance control, you know, a missile that's trying to follow and catch an aircraft or something else. Also cars, uh, motorcycles, you know, designing those vehicles to have good performance, high performance, good cornering, good handling over rough roads. Um, another interesting application are microsensors. This is something that when I was your age was only dreamed about. Um, making a tiny sensor on a chip and um, we'll talk later about how this is actually done but these devices are what are used in your cell phone so that your cell phone knows which way is up if you turn the phone from vertical to horizontal that sensor registers a change in the gravitational acceleration and it tells the phone to flip the screen so that you can um, you can see things the right way so again, something that was only imagined when I was a student and now is a part of every phone and it's something you buy for less than a dollar add on to the phone so that it can have this feature. Um, again, dynamics is also again often used in trying to predict loads or forces on all kinds of different structures. Um, and not just machines, but also even the human body. I guess you could say the human body is one of the most complicated machines we could study. We have lots of different linkages, lots of different muscles or actuators, and the way that you move and the coordination and the forces that those muscles put in is all, um, is all controlled by the brain, uh, through, which is you know just an amazing control system, a complicated system. To be able to model this and understand this, you really need 3D dynamics. Okay, so those are some applications. Be able 
to do dynamics, we're going to need to have a strong grasp of vectors and um, some of the math that you've learned in the past. So we'll just really quickly review some of those things um, here. So remember, if we have two vectors, a vector is something that has magnitude and direction. So it has a length and it has some orientation. And if we had vector A and B and we wanted to add them together, the usual way to do that is to put them tip to tail, and then we connect the tail of one to the tip of the other, and that would be the sum there of A plus B. Um, similarly, subtraction, we don't know, we don't have vector subtraction defined, so what we do is we take vector B and we flip it backwards. So this is now the negative of B. Then we put that tip to tail with A, and here is our sum of those two vectors. Now a vector has magnitude and direction, but it doesn't have an origin. So this is A minus B. This is also A minus B over there. And here what we did is just connect uh, the two vectors tail to tail and do it that way. I don't recommend thinking of it that way. I always like to think of it as flipping the vector around and putting them tip to tail all the time. So all we ever do is addition. But um, in any event, either of those gives us the, uh, the addition or subtraction of those vectors. Two other concepts we'll use a lot is the dot product uh, and the cross product. First, the dot product. It's defined as the length of the two vectors multiplied together and the cosine of the angle between. So if the vectors have a very small angle between them, uh, we get a large, a large dot product. If the vectors are orthogonal, we get none at all. So this kind of tells us how in line two things are. So if we had a block that could move this way and we had a force applied at an angle, the dot product would tell us what component of that force is really going to contribute to the acceleration or to the velocity of that block if it's like sliding on a guide so it can only move in that way, for example. Um, so the dot product, um, again, kind of tells us the product of the two vectors in a way that respects their direction or giving us the component of the direct vectors in a common direction. So notice graphically if we did B cosine phi, that would just be the component of V of B in the direction of A. It's that component right there. And we can do the same thing with A. A cosine of phi would be the component of A that's along the direction of B. Everything that's left, this would be the part of A that's perpendicular to B. Right? So that's a different component. And so the dot product is, is kind of like the product of those two components but then we only um, use the cosine once. The cross product is um, kind of the inverse, you could say, or it's kind of the complement, I guess, is a better way to say this, because now what we're doing is we're keeping these perpendicular components. And you probably remember from dynamics that this is used to calculate moments. So if we had this complicated robot arm and we have some force due to this cable uh, between the cable and ground right and we know that that force has to be in a certain direction if we wanted the moment that that force will cause about point a we would take a position vector from a to c so this is the vector of c as seen from a and then we would cross that with the force, and that would tell us what moment we can expect about point A. And that moment will cause this whole machine to rotate about point A. So um, notice here it's the perpendicular components, right? It's this component perpendicular to A that contributes to the cross product. The parallel component doesn't at all. 
um, because you can imagine if our force was acting out this way, it would have no, con no moment at all about point A, right? So we're trying to find the component of the force that's in that perpendicular, that's in that uh, perpendicular direction. Evaluating cross products can be done in a few different ways. Uh, many of you probably use, learned this matrix method where if we wanted the cross product between A and B, we have to remember to put A and B top and bottom. The direction does matter for cross products. With the dot product, the order of multiplication isn't relevant. With cross products, it is. And then um, you can do a determinant rule where we first take i, that first part, times this determinant. So we'd have ay bz minus az by. And then we alternate signs. So for the j component, we have a negative, And we do the determinant with a matrix made of those two pieces, and so on. Again, that should all sound really familiar, so I'm blazing through it. Feel free to ask questions in class. In this class, it'll usually be more efficient to do cross products component by component, because usually we won't have all elements of a vector. We'll just have a few. And this gives us a little more of a physical feel for what's happening. So you can do that by either memorizing this table which tells you that the cross product of anything with itself is zero because i cross into itself, the perpendicular component is zero that's perfectly parallel, right? Um, and then you can memorize the fact that i to j gives us k, that j to k, we go back around the circle and we get i. And so you can kind of just um, learn them all that way. What I like to do and what will be useful in a lot of the problems we solve is the right-hand rule. And the way we do that is imagine that if we want the cross product between i and k, so vector i and vector k, we take our fingers and we point them in the i direction. We're going to want to curl them into the k direction. So you can imagine if I take a hand and I put my fingers in the I direction, and if I want, if it's my right hand, and I want to be able to curl them in K, then my thumb is going to need to go like that, so that I can close up my right hand, such that my fingers end in the K direction. So the thumb is pointing downward, so because it's pointing downward in the opposite direction of the J axis, we know that that cross product is a minus j, the, or the cross product between i into k is minus j. And notice that matches what we have in our little table here. The order does matter. If we did that k to i, we'd, um, you'd see we'd have to orient our hands such that the thumb was up, and k cross i as this one right here is in a positive j. So anyway, you can get all of that with a little picture. Um, and if you know that right-hand rule, that'll come in really handy. One last piece of review of math. Um, you probably remember the, the chain rule that says that if we're taking the derivative of a product of two, um, two components, we take the derivative of the first times the second and then the first times the derivative of the second. This slide just reminds you that a dot product and a cross product both behave in the same way. Um, the derivative treats the dot product as if it was a uh, multiplication. So we can do a derivative of a times b and then a times derivative of b. And also again with the dot product um, we can switch the order. It's not order sensitive, so we could change this to b dot a. We can't do that with the cross product. Okay, so that um, maybe seems, uh, it's hard for you to imagine at this point how we're going to use that, but we will. So uh, hold on to that. If that doesn't make sense, go back and review your math a little bit. 
Let's look at an example of how we might use all of this. This is a really a 2D example, something that you could have done or might have already even done in EMA 202. But uh, I think it's good to remind you how we get equations of motion, how they can actually be solved. We're going to spend a lot of time in this class learning how to solve equations of motion. And so let's find one early on here and learn how to solve them or excuse me, we're going to spend a lot of time in this class finding equations of motion. And so I want you to know that they can be solved and what that solution looks like and the kind of information we might get from that. So let's take the example of a rocket. If you're on one of the rocket teams here, this could be really relevant to what you're doing for your project. So we have a rocket and the engine produces a thrust F. And um, it has a mass m, so gravity is going to cause a downward force of mg. And we're told there's also a drag force, so air is uh, exerting a force that's uh, c, some constant times mv squared. So, um, so these are all the forces that we have exerted on the rocket. And if we wanted to find an equation of motion and figure out how the rocket will move, we have to define a coordinate. And let's say that y gives us the position of the center of mass. Right. So um, once we know that, we could say then that the sum of the forces on this side, those are all vectors, is equal to the mass times the acceleration vector, excuse me, or is equal to m y double dot in the vertical direction. And um, why is it, why is that upward? In statics, you might have gotten in the bad habit of trying to figure out which direction the forces are acting in and like which way will this move. In dynamics, we don't ever worry about that. We don't worry about F or FD, which one's bigger, which one's smaller. All we do is look at the fact that Y was defined positive upward, and so we'll define the acceleration as also positive upward. And we'll write it this way, and then the math will tell us whether the acceleration is positive or negative. So for example, um, now if we take the sum of the forces in the vertical direction, we'd have this force minus mg minus cv squared, and then that's going to be equal to my double dot. So that tells us if the force is bigger than the weight and the drag from air, that our acceleration will be positive. Right? And if the force was the thrust force was smaller, the rocket won't accelerate in a positive direction. It'll fall. It'll accelerate towards the Earth and come crashing down. So that's our equation of motion. We would often use this to try to find um, y double dot. And usually we don't just want the acceleration. We also want the velocity and the position. We want to know as we fire this rocket up, you know, what will its position be as a function of time. So to do that, we solve this equation for the acceleration. So we divide everything through by m, f over m, minus, uh, the m's cancel, so we just get minus g minus c over m. And the velocity is just the, ex um, is just the derivative y dot. So um, now we have an equation of motion that tells us how this system is governed. OK, so here it is, uh, fancier, though I'll add the squared there. Um, so once we have that equation of motion, we can solve it using MATLAB. Um, to do that, we have to put it in a special form. MATLAB can solve equations of this form we can have a vector x whose derivative is equal to some vector function f 
oh, sorry, there shouldn't be a dot there, of x. So we define some vector, and we need a function that defines its derivative. You can see that here, we're already there if, we, um, if our quantity of interest was v. This would be v dot f over m minus g minus c over m v squared. Right? This would be a special case where we would have a scalar function with v dot equals f of v. Right? In the, if in the vector case, in the case where we want y to be our coordinate, we have to do a little trick that I think you've learned before, so I'm not going into a lot of detail. But we have to define a vector x that allows us to um, have on the right-hand side all the quantities that we need. So in this case, we would say that x is the position and the derivative of the position or the velocity. So that x dot becomes the velocity over the acceleration, or a 2 by 1 vector that has velocity and acceleration. Now, Notice that we can write this equation, um, x dot, y dot, y double dot. That will just be equal to y dot, which is the second state, x2. And this equation we can also write in terms of x2. It would be f over m minus g minus c over m x2 squared. And so that would be our equation of motion for this um, system. So we could um, easily go solve that. Uh, now in MATLAB we can plug this in and MATLAB will know how to solve the differential equation to tell us how this rocket moves in time. So let me flip over to MATLAB and show you how we do that. Um, on the course website, you can find both of these scripts. And so first, I define a function for the rocket, an equation of motion function. And this is just that function, x dot, is some function of x. So this function defines all the parameters for the rocket the mass, the drag force, the thrust force. Here I made the thrust force about 10 times bigger than the mass. And, um, and then this just implements those two equations that we just looked at. X dot is a, is a two by one vector. And um, we, if we pass in an x, it strips that apart to say the first element is the position, the second element is the velocity. And then it puts in the vector x dot the, um, the two terms that we just defined here. The velocity first, and then the acceleration second. So, um, we can use this to integrate the equation. First, though, I just want to show you if we pass into that function 0 for time and um, 0, let's say 0 and 100 meters per second. So 0 position, we're sitting on the ground, but we have a velocity of 100 meters per second upward. If we pass that to the function, it passes back that your velocity is 100. Well, thanks, I already knew that. I gave that to you, right? But also your acceleration um, would be 80 upwards because af as I take you know, the thrust force minus g minus the aerodynamic drag, uh, that's your net acceleration upwards. Um, so it's just a function that you can use in that way. And that's the first thing you can check to make something like this work. Once that's all working, we can um, use this to integrate the equation, we just tell MATLAB what our initial conditions are for position and velocity, the name of the function we want to integrate. We want to go from 0 to 15 seconds. By the way, if you ever forget any of that, just type help OD45 in MATLAB. And it gives you way more than you want, but it tells you how to call it, what will come out, 
will be time and y is a function of time. So let's go ahead and solve this. Um, so when we solve this, it spits out a plot of y versus time. Now notice um, here I called it q. I should have called it x to stick with my other notation. But anyway, um, what comes out is uh, a matrix where each column, the first column is the first state and the second column is the second state. What do I mean by that? Well, here we defined this relationship that said that the first element in our vector will be position, the second one will be velocity. So because we defined that, um, if we want to plot the position, we plot the first column. And if we want to plot the velocity, we plot the second column or the second state. They come in that same order, the same order that we pass the initial conditions into. OK, and so here we get our plot of velocity of the rocket versus time. So notice the rocket starts at zero velocity, it accelerates, and then uh, due to the thrust force, and then as the speed increases, it eventually levels out somewhere around 300 meters per second. So why does that happen? Why does it level out? Well, look at our equation. The acceleration is um, f over m. By the way, I'll show you a trick here in MATLAB. If I just select this and hit um, Control Enter, it will, oh, sorry, Shift Enter, I guess. Oops, no, it was Control Enter. Actually, sorry, on this version of MATLAB, it's broken on the surface, so I have to copy and paste. But anyway, if I paste these things in, um, we can look at why that happens. So the acceleration due to the thrust, f over m, is 100. But we subtract from that g. That gets us down to about 90. And then um, we have that last term. But we have to multiply that by the speed squared, so at 300 miles per hour, or meters per second, say, um, that that is a, a drag force of 90. So when you put all of those together, by the way, the up arrow in MATLAB will give you back your previous command, so you don't have to retype it. So if we put all those together, the net acceleration is just um, is near zero, so the rocket has stopped accelerating because of the drag force. Um, and we also could have got that by just taking our equation of motion and asking it, what would be the velocity and acceleration if we're traveling at 300 meters per second? And it tells us, well, your speed is 300 and your acceleration is 0.19, or it's headed towards zero. OK, so ODE45 uses that to integrate the equation. And so this is just an example of how that's done. Um, and that understanding is critical to debugging this. Because let's say you made a mistake here, and you accidentally, um, you accidentally put the wrong sign in for the drag force. When we run this, what happens? Notice now the velocity is just shooting up, right? Actually, it's 10 to the 16th. It's this huge number. It's kind of hard to make sense of that. Um, if we zoom in a little, we can see a little better. Basically, the velocity is just shooting up, and then it just skyrockets. It's headed towards infinity. So what does that tell us? there's something going on in our equation that's causing the velocity to increase. And the faster we go, the more we accelerate, or the more the velocity increases. So we look at our equation, and we, we see, well, which term is responsible for acceleration? These are both constants, so it must be that term. 
And oh yeah, if my velocity is positive, my acceleration should be negative, not positive. All right, and so then we're able to fix that sign and run it and get the right answer. So um, using OD45 is not just about matching the pattern, it's about thinking about your equation of motion, what each of these terms is and does. And that's one of the key things we use to debug code to understand whether simulations are giving us the right answer. Because we're all human. Uh, we make mistakes, and usually we don't get it right the first time. All right, so that concludes our example here of using OD45 and some of the review. We will see you at the next lecture.